Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever your time zone may be. Welcome to my talk on kernel email tools today. Um, I'm Frank Rowand. I work for Sony. I've been working on the kernel for quite a few years. So the kernel patch submission process is, is pretty important to me as it is to most of you probably who are listening today. If you have questions, I should be in the live chat and hopefully can interact with you through the talk. So feel free to send questions in. Uh, why, why is this talk an interesting talk? Um, when we send changes to the Linux kernel source, we send them via patch emails. And you might ask the question, or you might already know the answer. Is this process efficient? Is it easy to use? And the sarcastic answer I have is, yeah, it's efficient, but there have been many complaints over the years about ease of use. So I'm going to start with a, an overview of what the patch flow looks like. This is a really simplified conceptual view. Don't hold me to its total correctness in the technical sense. And it will show how patches are created, submitted, and then applied once they're received. And we'll be seeing this picture multiple times through the presentation. And I'll be adding on layers as we go through the talk. So you'll see this many times. Um, you start in the top left, and you're working in a source tree with your base files. You modify those files, and somehow you create a difference of those, which results in a set of patch files, as we see here. And those patch files then need to be sent via an email client to an email server. They go into the internet, and at the internet, they can take two different paths. And typically, for the kernel, you will the patch series will take both paths. Um, in one direction, it'll go through an email server to an email client to very specific people like maintainers or people you may have CC'd on your patch. And people who receive the emails then need to save those emails and create patch files, which they will then, <laughs> through some magic patch tool, apply to base files and end up with the same modif files, modified files that you have created. The alternate path, once you hit the internet with the a series of emails is your emails go to a list server like Linux kernel mailing list, LKML, and they'll sit in an archive. And then people can query that archive with the web server, pull the patch emails down through their web browser, and then rejoin the path, create patch files, and patch their, their environment. So what could possibly go wrong with such a simple process? I've been accused of saying it's a simple process, and for years and years I did say so. And finally, I've relented, and I admit that in reality it's a very complex process. There's plenty of room for human errors. It is difficult to use, and usability is, is not especially good. So in a more a different way of looking at what can go wrong, all those emails are, are going in through these various boxes. And what goes into any of these boxes may not look like what comes out. That data may be transformed at the various points in that flow that is shown in the previous diagram. And you may or may not have any ability to control how those transformations take place. Your IT department may control servers. Of course, the internet is totally out of your control in general. And even your own email client may or may not uh, be adjustable in your own world. Your IT department may, may or may not restrict you. So here's that original diagram. And I'm going to put the blender on some of those various points where data can be mangled. And hopefully this is a, a conservative estimate. Hopefully there are not more places. But I wouldn't be surprised if there actually were more places data could get mangled. So it's pretty extensive. If you think about it, it's kind of a scary world out there. Now, given that, that those data transformations do occur, we know that's going to happen. What, hap what, what do we do to react to that? Um, we can sometimes fix those transformed patch patches. An example of that is a patch may be converted from plain text into a base64 representation 
and there are various tools that can undo that. But that manual fix up is extra work. And over the years, the different maintainers and developers have developed their own set of scripts and processes to solve these issues. So we do not, do not have consistency, we do not have scaling. There are some solutions that have evolved over the years. And as of 2019, there were Git tools and they had existed for quite a while before, before that point. But when we got to 2019, the tools that we were using to deal with some of these issues were Git format patch, Git send email, and Git AM. And going back to our favorite diagram, we have our starting point and then we'll see where we use those Git tools. And you can see that Git format patch and Git send email provide us useful tools to create and email patches. And at the receiving end of that flow, the git am command allows us to take patch files and actually apply them to a tree. Typically that's coming in in inbox form or mailbox form. Then in June 2018, no, I, I am going backwards around from 2019 to 2018. <laughs> um, we, we see an email coming from Constantin at the Linux Foundation. He's provided a new service, the Lore Mail Archive. And he's announcing here in, in June of 2018 that it's, it's up, it's working, it's now solid. And he provides a, a URL providing some more information about it. And at the end of my slide set, um, after my final slide, I have a set of resource slides and there'll be some more information about Lore there where you can uh, learn some more information about things like what what's archived on Lore. Uh, so I refer you to that, but I'm not kind of talking detail about Lore at this point. So going back to our, our diagram, this is what things looked like before we added Lore. And we had Lore in the top right corner, and now we have a dependable archive instead of the various random archive servers that it previously existed. So we can start depending upon Lore as a solid archive, which is a, a very useful piece of the puzzle, which we're, we're going to depend upon a little bit later here. Then there was some discussion in late 2019 um, of kernel workflow, trying to improve the workflow and solve some of these email issues and here we have in January 2020 that Constantin has done some more work. He's done some development and come up with a helper script. And he's using the script to grab an email um, patch thread from this archive that now we can depend upon. And he saves that out as an inbox file. So the cool thing about that is once you have an inbox file, you can just pass it straight to git am and that gets that then it gets applied to your your git archive. So you'll notice this is um it's a quick and dirty script at this point. It's not really solid. And he, he um asks for some assistance. He says, you know, try it out. Let me know how it works. And it's it's a bit raw because it's it's early development. And it's kind of prototype, and there are a lot of corner cases. This is a, a rather difficult problem set. Um, so he's looking for how it works for people. And so to set expectations a little bit more on that, that topic, this really is a difficult task that this tool is trying to, to deal with. It's analyzing emails that were created by humans. It's trying to deal with email subject lines that are kind of random. We, we do have standards about what they're supposed to look like, but there's a lot of um, human variance in what they actually end up looking like. And then those emails, as I mentioned before, go through various email systems, clients and servers get transformed in various ways. So the expectation at this point is that uh, B4 is going to have hiccups I'm going to confuse you when I say before, because here I said the tool is get lore uh, mbox. <laughs> it's, it's not called before yet, but it's going to become before in a slide or two. Um, so I'm saying that the get lore mbox and then before is going to have issues. 
that's, that's just the way the world is. It's a complex world. The good news is that Constantin is very, very responsive when people report issues, when people report bugs, and he seeks out suggestions for improvements. So I was getting ahead of myself on the previous slide by mentioning B4. Uh, along in, in March of 2020, a couple months later, we get another email from Constantin, and he's decided that maybe this stuff is is important enough it should become an actual Python project. And so he's he's packaged things up a little bit better, and he's renamed the project from Get Lore Mbox, and now it's called B4. So you may in the future or in in historic references, you may see references to Get Lore Mbox. Uh, but in the rest of this talk, I'll be talking about B4, which is the new name for the same tool, and how it's evolved since then and grown and, and expanded. So once again, back to our diagram. And this is what it looked like when we last saw it. We're going to add one more box or two boxes and down on the lower left. This is showing where B4 now fits into the picture. So there are two ways that B4 can be used. If you look in the box here, which is the web browser to patch files transition area, B4 is going to be downloading patches from the lore archive. So you could conceptually extend this box maybe a little bit further up and to the right. And it will then create patch files in the form of an M box. Now you can tie B4 together with Git and passing the output of B4 through a pipe to Git AM, you can then go further and do your, your Git repository updates and changes. So it looks like a small addition. It's just down that little lower left-hand corner, just two, two new boxes. But that little addition has an immense impact on improving the workflow. It makes things work much better, much easier. I've shown in that diagram where what B4 is doing is replacing the email server in the email client. But B4 actually has many other features, but I will not be talking about those in the talk today. So there's, there's more to be explored in future talks. So here's B4 in all of its glory. And you'll see the version I'm working with is latest top of tree, 0.5.2. As of, I guess today is late October. Um, one thing to be aware of is that B4 does require Python 3. Currently, the version has to be greater than or equal to 3.6. When GetLore Mbox first came out, I was running on a couple of rather relatively old systems, various vintages, and I can attest that even though it, it worked in many cases, there were there were strong dependencies where where often the program just couldn't work with the older versions of Python. And so I strongly recommend you you don't even try using old releases. Move to to new releases of your distribution if you want to use before. Otherwise, you're just setting yourself up for a lot of pain. I'm going to be showing some various B4 help output through the next set of slides. And here's the, the top level of B4 help. And the thing we see here is that B4 is, is much like Git in that it has subcommands. And I've bolded out a few of those subcommands, mbox, am, and diff. And those are the subcommands that I'll be talking about later in this in this presentation. Diff, I'll give short shrift to a, a preview uh, that concept that it's or give you a, a foreshadowing. The other subcommands attest attest verify uh, pull request and a, generate a, a thanks email are more useful for maintainers than for submitters and for reviewers. And given the amount of time I have today, I'm going to ignore those entirely. So starting with the, the first command, before mbox, 
what this does is acquire a patch series email thread from the lore mail server and it puts it into an mbox file so this is the same functionality that was being provided by get lore mbox and here's the help for the mbox subcommand i'm not going to go through this in gory detail uh, but i'll mention a little bit here um or maybe not we, we will see the outdoor argument in an example um one important item a critical item is the message id and we'll see how that gets used so here's a using inbox to to pull in an example thread i went to my normal email client it's in my case is thunderbird and to find the message ID for an email, specific email, I have to select an email and then do uh, show message source. And that will show me the email headers. And within the email headers, you'll see a message ID. And, whoops, okay, I'll show it in the next slide. Um, so I have a, a message ID that I've acquired from my email client. It can be any of the emails in the thread. Uh, be for smart enough to find the entire thread from any of the emails in it and then pull the entire thread. So I'm doing a few things just for my own convenience. I'm making a temporary directory to work in, going into that directory, using the B4 command to tell B4 that I want to acquire the thread with this very long message ID. Thank God, goodness for cut and paste. I'd hate to be typing these things in by hand. And once before has done its work, it says it saved the results into this file that ends in a .mbx. And it's based the name of the file on the message ID that I passed into it. So if I do an ls, there I do see the mbox file. Okay, and I mentioned that I got the message ID from an email header line and in Thunderbird at the bottom of the slide is, is what that looks like. The subject date and message ID are coming from doing a uh, view message source in my Thunderbird email client. If I want to see what that inbox file looks like that I just created in the previous slide, I just use the, in my case, I'm using a MUT email client. So I just tell MUT, uh, MUT-F, that file name. And here we can see the list of all the emails in that thread, which include the patch emails and replies. Also includes the cover letter, patch zero of the series. So there's the example of that, that patch series that I just pulled, pulled in. And we're gonna reuse the same message ID value for a bunch of different commands. So anytime we see this orange big number, that's gonna be the same message ID over and over again. Um, so we just saw this as a repeat. And here's what I said. I just did mutt-f of that mailbox that I got created. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I, I confused myself here. Uh, this slide, a couple slides ago, this was my Thunderbird <laughs> email client. This is what that, that email series looks like there. And I just highlighted one of the emails, did my show message for us, and that's where I found my message headers was in there. So once I've run B4 inbox against that message ID, again, it created that inbox file containing the entire thread. And now I can look at that thread with MUT or any other email client. Uh, so I did a MUT, the dash F tells it to go look at that specific mailbox file that I just created. And here's what it looks like in MUT. And we'll see the same exact messages that we saw in Thunderbird. Uh, we'll see the, the original patches, we'll see the reply. Again, we'll see the patch zero of four, the, the cover letter. So once you have an inbox file, 
you can use any normal email client or you can use text tools to examine that, that .mbx file. And again, that, that thread includes the cover letter email, includes the actual patches, the patch emails, and any reply that has come back in the review process. So examples of these programs that you could use are MUT, like I used Elm, um, text, just typical standard text things are things like head, cat, more, less, VI, Emacs, your favorite text tools. Going to the next command from B4, going to uh, B4 AM, um, this does a similar parallel process where it acquires that, that patch series identified by the message ID again into an inbox file but it only includes the patches. It does not include any replies. And it also does not include the cover letter. So the cover letter is instead placed into a dot cover file. And I'm not quite sure why the dot cover file was created in the format it is. Uh, it's missing a single header line, which would make it an inbox file. And you can actually add that manually if you want to read that dot cover file with a, a mail client. So once you have the inbox file with just the patches in it, now you can apply, you can send that as input to Git AM, and Git AM will apply the uh, the actual patches as individual commits into your Git tree. So here's the full set of, of help for uh, B4 AM. And again, I'm not gonna go through the the details of all these arguments. You can see there, there are quite a few that I'm skipping over to provide useful functionality. And the second page of even more arguments. Okay, and then we're gonna start actually using B4AM, an example. Once again, for my own convenience, I'm creating a temporary directory and going into it, and then issuing the b4am command within that, that temporary directory. Again, I'm passing it the very same message ID, and we see the output from b4. is telling us that it's going to write into the mbox file, the mailbox file, these various patches. So it found four patches and wrote them into the mailbox file. And then it tells us it created a cover file which contains patch zero. And if I do an LS, indeed I do see the cover and the M MBX file. And you notice these have a, a different uh, file name pattern. They're not based on the message ID. They're instead based on the subject line. Okay, so again, this is just the patch files, the patch emails. There are no reply emails in this patch file, in the inbox file. And the text file is only the cover letter. So again, you can use your favorite email client or text tools to look at the uh, cover letter email file or the inbox file, which contains the patch emails. Uh, here, I give an example of trying to access the cover file with MUT. And when I pass it, that is an inbox file. MUT complains, it says, that's not a mailbox. And it's simply because one single header line is missing. And so then I just use the head command to show what, what that cover letter looks like. And normally, it's no big deal that you, you have all these extra email headers showing up. If you do a, a cat or more or whatever, you'll still be able to clearly read the cover email. And then if I use MUT to access the inbox file, this is that same exact patch series. You'll notice that the email reply is missing. All we see in this mailbox is the actual patches. So again, this is something we can send straight to Git AM to apply these patches as, as four different commits. So I already showed you this slide where I was creating the inbox file 
And one thing I didn't talk about before is that, whoops, sorry, jumped ahead of slide. Um, the B4AM command, at the very bottom, it tells you what git am command to use to process this mbox file. So you can just cut and paste this git am dot slash v2 underscore 20201008 underscore john, et cetera, et cetera. And that will apply them. So here, um, I'm, I'm condensing that whole previous slide down to just two lines. So it's telling us what that git am command is. And then I'm doing just a few extra git commands to make it more obvious uh, the results of what I'm doing so I can verify the validity of it. And so I, I create a new branch with a git checkout dash b. Um, I'm creating an, an artificial commit here just to make it easier to do a, a git log later showing the, the result of the git am. So I modify the make, make file, do a git add, do a git commit. So now we have one at one new commit on, on our new branch. And then I create a tag. So the tag is marking before I do the git am. And again, this is just for my own convenience. It's not something that, that I would normally be doing. It just made it easier to do my slides. So now I do the, the git am command. This is, <laughs> so all, all the, the previous stuff, we can pretty much ignore that. That's just kind of stuff to make my life easier today. So I actually do the git am command and git am applies those four specific patches as four, uh, four specific commits. And going to the next slide, if I do a git log showing from the tag I created forward, we see those very four single commits that we just, just created. That's the long way of doing things. You don't actually need to uh, create a, an inbox file and then process it. You can do a, a single one-line command. And again, I'm doing a lot of extra stuff just to uh, make it easier to show what's going on after the, after the fact. So I'm checking out, doing a checkout, creating a new branch. Again, modifying the make file just so I can have a, a, a commit that I can tag and creating a tag before I actually do any of the actual useful work. So again, all of this is, is not really needed. And here's the actual work of um, applying a, um, a patch series as git commits using b4. So it's the, the, the command is b4, I'm using dash q, so it's a little bit quieter but before AM, then the magic comes in dash O space dash. So dash O space dash is saying, send my output to standard list instead of sending it into a file. And then at the end of the line, I simply pipe it into git AM. You see before doing its work, it tells us what it's doing. And then we see git AM doing its work, telling us that, that it's applying these four different patch emails as separate commits. And again, to point out what actually we're doing with the B4 com command, all we're doing is we're saying B4 AM dash O space dash, send everything to standard out instead of into a, a work file, and then pipe it into git AM. So it's, it's very simple, very easy to use. And then this, this ugly ugliness, of course, is the message ID. So again, um, this is just showing that once I've done that single command, the git log will show those four commits actually did occur. There's another useful command, git range diff. And given the, the time available, I chose not to talk about that. Um, I instead suggest that you go to an animated example at this URL and uh, Constantin walks through the actual commands. You'll see them occur in, in real time um, showing how um, how B4 diff does it get range diff. 
I also provide some more information, again, in the resources and slides below the end of the talk, um, providing a little bit more information about range diff. So those are the very last two slides in the slide deck. And I'm not going to go through, again, uh, the arguments, but just to give you a sense that there are a lot of parameters available as part of the before diff command. Okay, so that's what B4 does for you. What can you do for B4 to make it work better? Uh, I mentioned very early on that this is a very difficult world that B4 has to work in, is trying to parse human-created input, human-created data. And there are things you can do to make it easier for B4 to do its work. Uh, there are standard Linux kernel uh, rules for how you format your, your subject line when you su submit patches and patch series. So basically, be sure to follow those as much as you can. And some of those rules are unwritten, and but just follow the standard rules and try not to do odd, weird things, basically. Uh, Constantin has gone to great efforts to actually deal with odd, weird situations and, and make the tool still work in all kinds of strange corner cases. You also can, can help improve before. I mean, typically people are saying, send patches, make it better that way, but you don't even need to go to that much work to make before better. Simply by reporting any issues that you encounter, um, any specific, so not not just issues, but also bugs, of course. And you report those at the tools mail list. You can get information about the tools mail list at that URL, linuxkernel.org slash g slash tools. You can either subscribe to that or just use uh, the archive to read what's there. And again, as I mentioned, Constantin, the tool author, is, is very, very responsive to user input. And he's been quite active and enhancing the tool throughout this year. No signs of, of slowing down at, on that at this point. So in review, B4 is your friend. It makes it much easier to acquire patch email threads. It makes it much easier to acquire patch series. It makes it much easier to actually apply those patch series. And then there are other more advanced features that I did not talk about. And I encourage you to use the, the help option to explore some of those many options. Um, some of the things I did not talk about is the review process. Uh, why is it important to be able to, to get uh, these, these email um, email threads, it's not just to apply the patches into your repository. It's also to be able to uh, read and review patches. Uh, so B4 is, is a convenient way to uh, find the, the contents of, of that entire series. It, all you have to do is find one single email in the entire thread, and then B4 will find all the others for you whether your email client does or does not. If you want to see other versions of the same patch, you can tell before to search for a different version. And that can be complex to figure out. You can imagine just as a human being when you're trying to find older or newer versions of a patch thread, did the subject lines change? Did the number of patches in the series change? Uh, even uh, the the title, the subject line of, of patch zero, the cover letter sometimes changes, making it quite difficult to, to go from one version to another in your searching. So it, when I was talking about how to uh, make life easier for before, that's another area to be thinking about, making sure you have consistent, uh, consistent values for your, your cover subject line, sorry, the subject line for your cover email and not changing that between 
different versions of, of your patch series. And that's the end of my prepared discussion. So again, I should be hanging out in the chat, answering questions. Be glad to help out any way I can. I'm gonna jump ahead for a moment and just show you some of the resource slides that are, are available. First of all, how to get a copy of the slides. Uh, you can email me. They'll be on the elinux.org website as all of the ELC and ELC Europe presentations are and the conference website from eventslinuxfoundation.org. Uh, some of those resources I mentioned, uh, I mentioned that there's information on the lore archive. This is the announcement of that. And it has some useful links. Uh, it shows you how to find out which mailing lists are actually archived. And here's some of those links. Which mail lists are archived by lore if you have a mail list that's not already archived that you want to add to it, there's information on how to request that. And just in general, there's more information there that's, that's worth reading. I did not not talk about how to get B4. Uh, it's available in two different ways. One is a, um, it's a standard Git repository and you can clone that or download it and the various uh, versions are tagged with Git tags. So if once you've uh, downloaded your, your Git repository, you'll want to look and see what the, the current tags are and check out one of those specific tags, uh, typically top of tree, I mean, well, most recent tag. And if you invoke B4 from your Git repository, at the top level, there's a file called b4.sh and that's your magic entry point. And that's what I was using in this the examples in this talk. I simply created a, an alias where B4 invoked this B4.sh file. The alternative way is using pip, which if you're a Python person, you'll be familiar with pip. And here's some information about the details you need for using pip. Again, these slides will be available. I'm not gonna leave them up for you to write to, to copy them down. Um, again, if you have issues, here's the place to report bugs. And then I have all the help pages for all the commands. And then a little bit more information about B4 diff. So those resources are there for you to look at after the conference. So back to questions, any questions? Feel free to join the chat. 